uh, pleasure today of having uh, Ambassador Darcy Vedder um, coming over and talking to us and to introduce her. Uh, we have our Dean, Aaron Carmel, from the Coca School of Business. Thank you, Michelle. Thank you for organizing. Um, let, me, uh, let me see who you are here in the audience first. Um, how many of you are students from the Kogat School of Business? And obviously uh, the others are from outside. How many of you are from SIS? Okay, so that's our School of International Service. They, they seem to uh, be particularly interested in this. So it is my pleasure to, and my honor to introduce Darcy Vedder uh, to the Kogat School of Business here at American University. Uh, Ms. Vedder serves as Chief Agricultural Negotiator with the rank of Ambassador at the Office of the U.S. Trade Representative. I should have, I should have called you Ambassador Vedder and not Ms. Vedder. I apologize. She's responsible for bilateral and multilateral negotiations and policy coordination regarding agriculture and trade. Um, she was appointed in 2014. Prior to that, beginning in 2010, um, she served in the U.S. Department of, of Agriculture as Deputy Undersecretary, and she oversaw the department's international activities. Before joining the USDA, uh, she served as International Trade Advisor on the Democratic staff of, US Senate, of the U.S. Senate Committee on Finance, where she advised Chairman Max Baucus. Prior to that, she, was, um, she served six years at the office of the U.S. Trade Representative, the USTR, so she, in a sense, is coming back home. And um, she, amongst her other activities during that time, she was Director for Sustainable Development, which I know our students and students across campus are very interested in. She has uh, a degree from Princeton, and most important, at the end of her official biography in the very last sentence, it says she grew up in Nebraska on a family farm. So it is my pleasure and my honor to welcome Darcy Vetter. Thank you very much for that kind uh, introduction and thank you very much for having me. Um, it is uh, not as often as I would like that I get the opportunity to interact uh, with the university community and with students in particular. So I'm really pleased uh, to be here. In my experience, um, sometimes getting away from the negotiating table and from your direct counterparts are where you get the questions that make you think a little bit more about uh, why it is we do what we do and different approaches to take to get there. So I look forward to talking with you uh, tonight after the presentation as well. Um, just a little bit about what it means to be the chief agriculture negotiator. Uh, this is a, it's a very specialized position, as you can tell from its, its title, but I do lead the negotiations both in multilateral fora, so at the World Trade Organization, for example, on agriculture, uh, in concert with our, our uh, deputy USTR, who's based in Geneva, Ambassador Punk. Uh, but also then the agriculture parts of our bilateral negotiations, which right now is uh, very heavily focused on the Trans-Pacific Partnership, uh, an agreement we're negotiating with 11 other Asia-Pacific countries, but also the TTIP, the Transatlantic Trade and Investment Partnership that we're negotiating with the EU. Um, it also means bilateral negotiations to try and solve trade problems, uh, opening our beef market to China, for example, trying to improve the way China operates its approval system for the products of biotechnology and things that can really cause trade irritants between our countries. Um, so that's a, a lot of sort of on my to-do list each day are those kinds of things. Um, I'm also just wanted to say before I dive into the talk that when I was sitting in that chair, um, some of the things I found most useful from the people who were behind the podium were often uh, answers to questions about well, what did you do after school to end up where you are now? Um, how did you, um, what were your successes or your missteps? How, how do you balance your life? Uh, I'm not sure I'd be very good at answering that uh, right now, but I'm certainly willing to try. And so would be very happy to talk about um, what I think are some really rewarding opportunities for careers in public service, um, but also just about how um, my career path has worked and, and how that might uh, be helpful to you. Um, so I guess uh, we'll start right in on tonight's question, which is to look a little bit of stepping back from a trade negotiations per se, but sort of trying to look at the trade framework and how trade policies in and of themselves can contribute 
to underlying agricultural development questions. And this is true for um, development sort of writ large. A lot of these will have cross application, but particularly in the field of agriculture. But first, I think it's helpful to take a little bit of a step back and to look at exactly where we are and the challenges we have in front of us. So the Global Harvest Initiative is an interesting group of both corporations and academia and nonprofits who are looking at um, where do we need to be in agriculture and food production in the near term. And we've got quite a cha challenge in front of us. Uh, we need to double f food production between now and 2050 in order to meet the demand for food, fuel, and fiber. Um, there are some scientists who have said that the amount of innovation in agriculture and in agricultural productivity that we've seen over the past 10,000 years <laughs> will need to be exceeded in order to bring us to this point. And that's, of course, in part because of rising demand. Not only is our population going to go from seven, a little over seven to nine and a half billion people, it will be a more urban population, and it will be a population that currently, many of those people in that population are not meeting their nutritional needs so we need to bring uh, their, their calorie loads up as well. So it's more people to feed, more people who are not living close to rural production areas, and better nutritive value. And essentially, so um, one way to put that is that our goal is not just calories, our goal is food security. And the way that that is typically defined is that food is available. It is uh, in a place that um, you can access it consistently on a year-round basis. It is affordable. It's not just in the marketplace, but people actually can bring it into their homes. It's affordable for their diets, and it's nutritious. It's not all of your calories coming from one place, but it provides the variety of nutrients you need to maintain health. So available, affordable, and nutritious. And if you look particularly at those, those urban dwellers and those, um, the little figures of the people from the last slide who are improving their diets, that's a representation of part of the population that's entering the middle class. And the reason that that's important is because right when people get a little bit more disposable income, what they eat and how much they eat changes dramatically. And that is that they go from a diet basically based on grains to one where they demand protein. So that's poultry, that's dairy, that's beef, pork, fish, um, all of those things uh, become a much more integral part of the diet. But all of those things also require more energy to produce and uh, different types of inputs. So it's not just that we are trying to meet the food demand for the extra population, but that that demand itself is higher because what we're trying to do is give them more protein, uh, which is of course important for a healthy diet as well. Um, just from a, a US trade negotiator and agricultural perspective, a lot of these products are also things that the United States is very good at producing. <laughs> and so we're particularly interested in some of the countries where you see this rising demand and an increase in the middle class. So what do we need to do to meet that demand? Well, there's a lot of things, right? There's improved research. There's better extension uh, policies. There's um, just increasing productivity through better seeds. There's better water usage, all sorts of things that you need to do to bring better productivity to meet demand. But there's also the question of how does food move to, from the people who need it um, and from the people who produce it to the people who need it. And that's where trade policy comes in. So tonight I wanted to talk a little bit about some of the trade policies that can help us to achieve that common goal we have, which is to feed that burgeoning population. So we want to use trade policy to reduce the cost of moving food. At, you know, it's most basic what trade does is it takes a product from an area of surplus and sends it to an area of scarcity. How can we do that in the best way? How can we make sure that the producers of food are receiving the proper signals about the demand for their product so that they make good decisions? How can we improve our infrastructure to make sure, again, food can get from place to place uh, and that we're making investments in the way to do that, and both efficiently but also safely? When food arrives at the borders, when agricultural products move, how can we reduce red tape so that the costs and the, the quality um, pieces that are associated with it can change? And then how can we support international standards for food safety and quality? So when people um, are producers of food, they know how their product is going to be judged. They know what standards they will have to meet to be accepted in the marketplace. And then I don't want to uh, miss a point just at the end about agricultural services and the kinds of um, techniques and that are needed to make all of this happen. Uh, there's a marketplace for those two that needs to be open. So 
really the first thing you want to do if you want to reduce the cost of food moving between borders you just need to get tariffs down <laughs> and they are persistent problems um, and it's particularly interesting if you look at where the food trade is going to occur in the future and where the highest tariffs are so that growth in the middle class those people who are suddenly going to demand both more calories and a greater variety of food that's all happening in developing countries the growth in the middle class is about 11%, as you can see in developed countries like this one. But in a lot of the developing world, we're seeing 120% growth. Um, the entire population of the US, that number of people will enter the middle class in the next eight years in China. That's pretty stunning <laughs> in terms of their buying power and their demand um, for agricultural products. But um, it's also true that these are the countries that have the biggest barriers to trade and agricultural products. So more food is going to places with higher barriers. If you look at, um, if you look at sort of the light blue and the dark blue here, these are bound versus applied rates and tariffs, and so I won't get you into <laughs> all of those details necessarily. But if you look at the imports, um, or I'm sorry, this is developed and developing. If you look at um, world agricultural imports in 2001, you know, 65% of the imports were coming from countries like ours. And the United States is still both the biggest exporter and the biggest importer of ag products in the world. But now, if you look at 2012, 52% of those imports were going into developing countries. So they're major players in the market as importers. But they're also major players as exporters. And more and more developing countries are becoming suppliers of food, and the places they're sending them to are other developing countries. So India already, who's a major exporter of wheat and rice, for example, 61% of its, the products that it markets are going to fellow developing countries. And so the opportunity for farmers, many of them poor in India, to participate in the global marketplace depends on other countries that are also developing, bringing those tariffs down. Uh, China's in the same boat. Uh, it's a little bit lesser to a lesser extent, but already it's sort of shifting from being an exporter from to developed to one being primarily exporter to other developing countries. And I think it's worth noting that if you look, for example, at the, just the countries that I'm negotiating with right now in the Trans-Pacific Partnership, the average applied agricultural tariff in the United States is 5.8%. The average tariff in Vietnam is 16.9%. And if you look at Korea's average tariff, which is quickly moving into developed country territory, its ag tariffs average around 60% on some of its key products. So its consumers pay more for key products that they need. And they're stopping development and trade opportunities between each other. So bringing those tariffs down is a priority. But we also want to improve market signals. And that's important for trade policy, both looking at trade within countries, but also trade between countries. And you know, essentially, if you're a farmer in your field in the middle of the country in the United States, you can click on your computer and find out what the county price is, what the Chicago Board of Trade price is, what the average sort of global price is for your corn, for your wheat, for your rice on any given day. And you can decide when you're gonna sell. You can do forward contracting because you act, have access to that good information, to what the futures market is, you know whether you're getting a good deal. That's just not the case in a number of markets around the world. And that's partly a matter of domestic policy, not just trade policy, but to invest in that infrastructure. It's also really important for technology, and I'm sure many of you have heard about the, the um, programs through the Grameen Bank and others where small farmers can get in a text message on their cell phone what the price is at the local market on any given day. So even if they have to deal with middlemen, they, they are doing so with good information and can negotiate a better price that keeps money in their pocket. And that's really a key part of how we're going to actually meet the demand for global food is to send, again, the right mar market signals to producers and make sure that they are fairly compensated. So um, again, a commitment to open markets, to transparency in the marketplace, and using technology as a powerful tool so that everyone along the supply chain knows where prices stand. It also in, um, requires discouraging the use of administered prices, or what we think of as agricultural subsidies, particularly subsidies that provide a price floor or an administered price. Because frankly, that tells farmers to ignore the market. That even if your cost of production um, is pretty high compared to the world price, as long as you're covered on the floor price, you're going to keep producing. 
what that means is maybe you aren't producing a crop where you could frankly make more money that might use resources better um, because you don't have to manage risk and you don't have to watch a market price. And so you tend to overproduce uh, crops that have a higher administered price, underproduce where there might frankly be demand for and access to markets elsewhere where you could receive a better price for your, um, for your crop. And again, it mixes up the supply and, de and demand signals that, that farmers need to see to make good decisions about um, the use of their resources. And finally, export restrictions are an increasing problem in the international marketplace that really distort those signals again. And we saw a lot of it in the food, crisis, the food price crisis of 2008, much less of it when prices spiked again in 2011, 2012, um, but we still see this practice. And it's not just in food, it's in fiber. Um, you know, India really put an export restriction on cotton that is still reverberating through defaults in the international cotton market in a very big way and having a major impact on employment um, and basically the, the viability of textile mills throughout Bangladesh and the rest of Asia uh, because of this. So an export restriction, country like India in the case of cotton, wanted to make sure uh, when there was a rise in price and strong global demand for cotton that its local textile mills could get the cotton they wanted. So they banned exports which immediately dropped prices in India, which tells farmers in India, don't grow more cotton, when in fact what the world needs is a lot more cotton <laughs> to be able to fill demand. So Indian textile mills do fine because they can get all the cotton they want because it can't leave the country, but if you're a textile mill in Bangladesh, you can't get your hands on cotton to save your life because the price for the rest of the world spikes enormously. And that has a major employment effect uh, in an industry that of you know, I'm sure, is a major employer in Bangladesh. And so import-dependent populations continue to pay. They can't get the fiber or the calories that they need. Major producers, on the other hand, are receiving the signal that they're not going to get paid, and so they actually produce less. So things like export restrictions actually create a cycle of bad decisions by sending the wrong signals to, to the producers of crops. And the other piece is improving trade in infrastructure, and this is both an international as well as a domestic policy because many of the facilities that need good infrastructure, ports, uh, highways that run in between jurisdictions, often across countries, really take collaborative investment to make them uh, operate in a way that um, provide the most efficient path for goods to move in between countries. But frankly, getting that kind of collaboration can be pretty difficult to do <laughs> and being able to to garner the resources to make those long-term kinds of investments. Um, but they're critically important. Um, first of all, post-harvest loss is a massive problem in agriculture. Um, in this country, you know, growing up on a farm myself, we harvested our corn, we put it in a grain bin. And that grain bin happened to be made of metal with a nice cement floor and an electric grain dryer attached to it so that I wasn't putting it in a facility where it would be exposed to heat or dampness, that all of which degrade quality very quickly. But that kind of infrastructure and storage capability, which is critical, um, is really not available in a large part of the world. And that's not only important for the quality of the food to be able to sell it at a good price, but it, it directly affects the safety of that food as well. Um, and so again, you want to reduce post-harvest loss because we can't afford to lose the calories. You want to improve the marketing opportunities through storage. Remember I talked about before, if I'm a farmer in this country, I know when the price is good. And because I have the grain bin, I can wait a week to sell my product. If I don't have anywhere to put it, if the place I put it degrades its value, I have to sell even when prices are low. So it actually is a, not only protecting the crop itself, it's really improving farmer income opportunities when we store food well. Of course, it promotes food safety. A key problem right now in Africa is aflatoxin. It's basically a fungus that grows particularly on corn, which is a staple crop in Kenya, for example. Half of its crop each year is often plagued with aflatoxin. Aflatoxin causes liver cancer. <laughs> this is a severe health problems, both in livestock and in humans from consuming um, corn that is infected with, uh, with aflatoxin. So they're losing half of their crop. There are things you can do in the field if you have better technology and infrastructure. There are things you can do to test uh, product that comes out of the field so that you don't store product that's infected with fungus with product that isn't and cross-contaminate. And of course, if you store it well, it's gonna be more resistant to, to adapting it. So again, infrastructure is important there. And then of course, competitiveness. 
the one thing that I know as a negotiator with the United States is that if I can get tariffs fairly low, if I can get uh, people to judge my, my product based on sound science, on its quality, I'm going to win because I have good roads. <laughs> I have decent bridges. I have uh, a sophisticated population, a great um, mercantile exchange where I can deliver the thing I say I'm going to deliver to you on the date I'm going to deliver it. And there are a lot of farmers around the world who would be you know, extremely happy if they had that same kind of reliability and consistency. And so um, good having good infrastructure increases competitiveness across the board because you can meet, um, you can better negotiate and then meet the terms of a contract. And then there's improved policies at our borders. A lot of people don't trade because it's frankly just too, na it's too difficult to navigate the paperwork it takes to get your product over the finish line into another country. Figuring out all of the different kinds of licensing arrangements, your bills of lading, your invoicing, um, all of that is extremely difficult. And then once you get there, if the port isn't operating efficiently, if the exact procedures you were supposed to follow are not transparent, the entire value of your product can be lost in your demerge charges waiting for your product to be cleared. And it happens a lot. And it particularly happens in agriculture where it's very risky if you're shipping a product that is perishable. And that's um, you know, can, a particular problem for, you know, if you're a fruit and vegetable producer, you produce cherries. Cherries are shipped in this country by airplane to Asia because the days on the boat, they'd be mushed by the time they got there. If they sit at the border, your value's gone. So we have to make sure you have uh, efficient procedures. So again, it makes it hard for businesses just to figure out what they're supposed to do and then to be willing to take the risk to do it betting that things will be efficient once their product arrives. So again, the delays add to cost, they decrease quality, and non-transparent policies, I think this is critically important, really lead to corruption. The more you have a paper document that moves through more hands at a port, the more temptation there is to under-invoice, to over-invoice, to change product codes so that different tariffs are applied, to take a little product off to the side, to allow trade in things like illegally logged products, wildlife trafficking. A lot of those things can happen because procedures at ports are not transparent and not done electronically, frankly, because that paper is changing hands. So one of the, the key achievements in the international trading system in the last few years has been the Trade Facilitation Agreement, which was agreed at the Ministerial Conference of the WTO in Bali in December of 2013. It's really all about customs procedures. It's reducing red tape and unnecessary formalities and, and steps at borders. It creates a binding commitment. Every member of the WTO, which is now about 160 countries, agree to try and expedite the movement of goods, their release and clearance at customs, and to improve cooperation between customs officials in one country and another when the status of a particular set of goods is in doubt. It's very practical, it seems very simple, it's a lot of value on the table and it is a lot of what is difficult now about world trade in the very sort of tangible practical sense is being addressed. Key example, a key issue here is transparency. Information will be published online. Your trade and transit procedures and documents required will be available online. You know what form you're supposed to fill out, how to fill it out, where to get help to fill it out. Um, the duty that will be applied, any additional taxes and fees, right there, published, no surprises at the border. The procedures you would use to appeal, if you think your product is not being assigned the appropriate duty, if you think the fee charged is not appropriate to what your cargo um, specifications are, you know what to do to try and apply for relief. And then, frankly, this how-to. One of the things the Obama administration has been working on over the past few years in the National Export Initiative is simply educating people on where you start. Where do you go if you want to figure out whether you can export, whether you can meet the standards, and that how-to information being out there for people who want to export. And then these countries also are working on their efficiency. They're trying to do with better risk management. Are there insurance steps you can take? Are there ways you can try and get your product through? Um, processing pre-arrival. There are a lot of countries who you electronically send your document a day or two before your product, maybe even more, hits the port so that it's processed by the time your product physically arrives. There are a lot of countries where your product has to be sitting there, the paper has to come in with the cargo, and then you're paying the demerge charges and your customer's not getting that product until it can be cleared, so speeding up that process. And just reducing the number of documents overall. 
So again, the goal here is for your fair trade, and the value here um, is uh, particularly important. Um, and just stuck in here, particular um, parts of the trade facilitation agreement that are applicable to agriculture, because I, of course, get asked all the time by our ag producers, so what's in it for me? The trade facilitation agreement applies to the export of all goods and trying to expedite those process. There are a few parts uh, related to agriculture that are particularly important. Those expedited release procedures. If all you need to know is whether it's a 10% duty or an 8% duty, you can work that out and send the bill to a person later. Your tomatoes don't have to be rotting at the port <laughs> if that's the question. If there's not a safety problem or an issue, expedite the release of those goods, let people do business. Um, access to cold storage facilities at the port. A key part of the trade facilitation agreement is also, act is also access to capacity building funds for ports and, and for countries that currently don't have uh, these kinds of facilities to help expedite trade. So again, your perishable goods arrive at port, there's some sort of a, a problem about their release, they can at least have access to cold storage to improve their quality. And then, of course, new requirements on detention, transparency. If your product is detained, <coughs> there's a question about whether there's you know, a, a fruit fly in it. Is it a pest problem? Is it a mold problem? Is it a food safety problem? They're gonna be notified right away uh, when your product is detained, so you can try and resolve that problem and get your product to your customer. And I think the important thing here is this all sounds like very detailed nitty gritty, but it's really where the rubber meets the, road in, uh, meets the road in trade. The trade facilitation agreements procedures in and of themselves could save, um, cut trade costs by 15% for low income countries and 10% for countries like the United States. It could improve global incomes up to $40 billion and overall boost global D GDP by almost a trillion dollars by doing things that, frankly, are good common sense, but that require some global action to move in tandem to get them done. So again, you're gonna boost exports, all of that reverberates back into the good job numbers. In developing countries, the estimate is about 18 million jobs that could be supported by this agreement alone. Click the wrong button there. And then don't forget the trade and services piece here. All of the things that we need to do in agriculture to teach farmers better techniques those are extension services. Those are agricultural consultants. Those are researchers who have the ability to go into the field and work with farmers. That is trade and services. And a lot of countries, frankly, block the ability of professionals to work in their countries, and it requires trade liberalization to do so. So increasing agricultural productivity, teaching new techniques to conserve natural resources, teaching people how to use the new technologies. You can access goods that help you save water, but if you don't know how to install or use them, you don't save the water. Um, so again, the services have to come with them. Food processing, uh, food safety management, marketing services, all of these things, if people know how to use them, put more money in farmers' pockets in developing countries and are services that need to be uh, expanded and accompany other plans to uh, to again provide access to the goods and the physical uh, goods themselves. So we shouldn't forget about uh, liberalizing trade in that area as well. So with that, uh, just a few of the trade policies that you can use to improve uh, the agricultural situation. I will say thank you for your time and open it up to any questions you have. Beep, 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 beep. Yes, th so this is the point where we uh, actually go over and we say, yes, we have a microphone, so you don't actually have to yell to ask those things. And um, so, well, thank you very much, of course, and uh, I'm going to be asking people to be raising their hands, and Jonathan is already doing so. So, boom, there we go. Question, it seems that the uh, big initiative is to get rid of these implicit frictions to trade. Eh? Are we seeing pushback from countries where you remove their ability to have implicit restrictions, now they're pushing for explicit restrictions. I ask in the context of uh, India earlier, or last year, I should say, disagreeing with the WTO on wheat policies. Uh, what are your thoughts on the matter? Um, I, I don't know. I would say tariffs are pretty explicit <laughs> in terms of the restrictions just trade that we need to, need to address. Uh, those policies on the books, not just infrastructural uh, issues, but if you don't go after tariffs and subsidies, sort of those first two points about market signals and the tariffs themselves, 
um, you don't get the chance to do some of these other things. So certainly we are keeping our eye on um, both those sort of explicit policies as well as other domestic decisions uh, about um, infrastructure, et cetera. Um, India wanted, um, India essentially operates a program where they have both an administered price where they pay farmers a floor, a floor price and then they use the goods they buy to give out at a subsidized price uh, to people who need to eat it. But they, what they typically do, uh, whereas in the United States, for example, we have a debit card with a certain amount of money and individuals who qualify for our supplemental nutrition programs buy those foods in the grocery store at market price. So we are able to provide a feeding program, but we don't do it in a way that at the same time is linked to a program that provides a different market signal to farmers. And what happens is that as they expand one side of the program on feeding, they have continued to expand also the program where they offer these administered prices. And what you find is that once they have collected more wheat than they actually need or can administer in their feeding programs, they release massive quantities of that wheat at low prices onto the world market. So what our concern here is that the food security policies that countries adopt should not then undermine the food security of other countries by causing huge swings in global market prices. So um, our disagreement has been not that countries should have some policy space to operate feeding programs. We operate one that costs many billions of dollars, but we try to do it in a way that does not at the same time distort trade and markets for others. And so you know, they are asking for more policy space to say, because our domestic price support, the food that we buy goes to the poor then those subsidies shouldn't count against us in the WTO. But the fact is that their impact on world markets is the same, no matter what they're doing with the product at the end. And there are a number of examples out there of countries that, um, at all ends of the spectrum, not just rich countries like ours, who operate very effective feeding programs without at the same time creating these mixed up incentives um, that send bad signals to their farmers and then also might undermine markets for farmers in nearby Pakistan who are trying to go wheat grow wheat and suddenly have a huge drop in the world price when India exports. So that's the kind of effect and the, the issue we have right now about those feeding programs. And so we need to figure out what, if any, solution we need to, to seek in the WTO that would address that kind of problem and provide, is there policy space that countries like India need to be able to bring those policies in line with uh, policies that also better promote trade? Ambassador Vetter, thank you. That, that, that was a very nice talk. I want to have a little bit of fun with this question um, and talk about the, the most important thing in my life, which is coffee. Uh, so, so coffee is sourced from a band in, uh, near the equator, from Indonesia and Central America and East Africa. Um, tell us a little bit about what's happening vis-a-vis -vis coffee and why are we paying so much? that has um, really had a, a big impact on Colombian supplies, for example, uh, and uh, different weather events. But part of it is also just that we're drinking a lot of it and that there's also a high demand for different. Um, in some ways, it's, it's a success story on how differentiated that market has become and how you can buy uh, sort of commodity grade basic coffee that you might drink in you know a cafeteria or you can buy your Starbucks coffee or you can go to an even fancier coffee house and get your coffee by prescription you can buy coffee that's shade grown or organic or you know they've done a good job I think at putting adding value to what was once sold much more on a commodity basis and so part of it is that there are niche markets part of it is that global demand really has faced some challenges uh, uh, recently and um, you know there are, in fact, some pretty big trade barriers on coffee, particularly by coffee producers. <laughs> I have high tariffs on letting in coffee from elsewhere. Uh, but, um, but mostly I think it's a weather and disease issue. Go right ahead. I would just add, can I add a little bit to this answer? So one of my grad school colleagues is now the head of the Coffee Exporters Association of and so he asked me to come and give a talk. And who doesn't want to go to Cartagena in January? Oh, I think it was November, actually, and, and give a talk. But coffee in Colombia 
is a major source of their, their national currency. So, you know, I thought I was going to go give a talk about U.S. risk management policies in agriculture and about the U.S. Columbia Free Trade Agreement and how it had really integrated our markets, and that was great. And really, that is what I talked about, but I didn't think to myself the significance of agricultural markets, and particularly coffee in a country like Colombia. And I found myself talking to a board that included two of the heads, former heads of the central bank. I mean, it was the most interesting <laughs> discussion back and forth. He wanted to know about things like U.S. crop insurance and how we manage risk for farmers, and just an incredibly interesting discussion. But the very first question I got after I gave my talk wasn't a question at all. It was one of those very esteemed members of the board who stood up and said, thank you for the World Outlook Board at the U.S. Department of Agriculture. And that is the group at USDA that publishes the world supply and demand estimates and prices and what you know what's going to happen in markets and Colombia the major coffee producers of the world use USDA numbers that's what's driving their markets even though we don't really produce the stuff the power of our ability to collect those statistics and to provide good information and what kind of a backbone that gives to ag markets is just something that I'm so proud of that our country does and does well and it you know really gives producers all over the world a really good tools so that was a a learning moment for me about how we contribute to that global ag infrastructure. Hi there. Thanks for coming tonight. And so, um, you know, I wanted to ask a question about GMOs. Mm -hmm. And so this seems like you reference technology and advancement of science as something that's going to help trade. Mm -hmm. But for better or for worse, nutritionally, uh, you know, genetic modification and just interference in strains of, you know, organisms seems to be something that we're moving more and more towards, mm -hmm. and yet nations dis disagree vastly on you know, how this should be and what's, what's allowed or what's even desirable. And so do you see the, uh, you know, the kind of like the World Forum converging on this or in, in any way, or do you, do you see it being a, a bigger disagreement and bigger issue going forward? Well, I think there are, frankly, a lot of um, maybe lessons that can be learned from the introduction of different technologies, but also, um, ways that we hope the discussion about the use of the products of bio, uh, use of biotechnology and the products of them, um, that we can try and address those issues. And the first is that um, there's a difference between, uh, I think, some of the reasons that we face trade barriers to those products and others. And obviously when you have a novel product, and I don't think a lot of our biotech seed varieties or foods from biotech seeds at this point are all that novel. A lot of countries have had a lot of experience assessing them for quite some time now. Um, but you want regulatory authorities to have the resources and the information they need to make good decisions about the safety of those products. And really at the border, you know, U.S. policy has been, and the international standards surrounding those kinds of crops has been, that that's, that decision should be a scientific one. Are these foods safe for human consumption? Do they provide a problem for plant or animal health? And if the answer is no, then trade should be allowed. There's a slightly different issue about consumer information. And you know, are particular products of biotechnology associated with production practices that you as a consumer do or don't want to support? Are there reasons that you may want to choose a product that is not used that way? And that's a slightly different issue than a rule about trade. And so there are countries that prohibit or have restrictions on or have slow processes to approve these products for reasons of capacity. They don't have as many plant scientists. They don't have as many food safety officials. They don't have an efficient regulatory regime to be able to take the information that companies supply to say, here's my new product, could you approve it please, and move it through in a timely way. And so you get what we call asynchrony, where a product's approved in one market, not in another. When you try and move a product here to here, it gets hung up in the process. And then you have a number of countries who have decided, for reasons of competitiveness, let's be <laughs> honest about that, uh, as well as reasons perhaps of consumer opposition, that they've decided to stop those products at the border and that they use their regulatory regime um, and non-approval of those products to do that. Uh, and so I think a lot of it is done, uh, sometimes you have issues that are really political in nature but are done under the guise of science, sort of unjustified sanitary or phytosanitary or bar phytosanitary barrier, as it's called. Um, and so you see a little bit of both of that. Um, and so you have to try and, and uh, 
address that in a variety of ways. Thank you. Thank you very much, Madam Ambassador. Uh, I really enjoyed all the figures and all the information here. I'm just wondering, there is one uh, positive side and one negative side. The positive side, as you mentioned, the uh, Obama uh, uh, initiative, export initiative, which stipulated increasing export by 100% over a period of five years and uh, creating two million jobs was very successful. Uh, I am wondering if you can talk about, uh, what my simple question is, is the Doha round dead? I think that remains to be seen. <laughs> so uh, for those of you who aren't familiar with the Doha round of trade negotiations at the WTO, it was launched in 2001, but we've not yet completed it. And in 2008, we frankly hit a big stalemate at a ministerial, ministerial conference in Geneva, and we've been trying to get that, that round back on track ever since. And really what I think it comes down to is you know, how much skin in the game <laughs> are all of the countries willing to commit? And when it comes to agriculture, there are sort of three parts of what is supposed to be this global deal of the, of the Doha round. And one is market access, that's cutting tariffs. And the whole goal of doing this at the WTO is you have 160 countries at the table and everybody agrees our barriers come down at the same time. So nobody's <laughs> taking a unilateral step and it's too exposed. And in exchange for that new access, the new opportunity to send goods out and to frankly bring up price, support prices basically through new demand, new market access, countries that provide subsidies would agree to new commitments on domestic support to provide caps on the way that domestic support is provided. And the third pillar, so there's domestic support, there's market access, the third pillar is export competition. And those are things like curbing export subsidies. Uh, that, you know, looking at export credits, looking at the way that food aid is provided and making sure that in-kind food aid doesn't disrupt local markets and have unintended trade effects. So trying to, to discipline some of those things. And the idea was that if you get the right set of trade-offs on those three areas, everyone could kind of move together and we'd have a more open playing field in agriculture. We could never quite get the trade-offs right. <laughs> and in fact, what's happened since 2001 the major subsidizers in agriculture were the U.S., the EU, and Japan. If you look today at the amount of subsidies provided to agricultural producers, China, India, then EU, Japan, U.S. And those last three countries, the amount of money that they've spent, oh, Brazil's in there too, I forgot. Um, the amount of money we've all spent in the developed economies on agricultural subsidies is going down, while those emerging economies are going up. And at the same time, the charts I showed you earlier India, China, Brazil, massive agricultural exporters. So um, they have a huge impact on world markets, not only through the supports they provide, but just because of the volume of their participation in global markets. And so the Doha round where we left it, where the equation sat in terms of who had to cut by what. Developed countries had one level of cuts they had to take, and all the developed countries were going to take a lesser cut. And not only that, but there were a number of special safeguards, there were exceptions for special products and sensitive products where they could reduce the cut they took or not take a cut at all. And so by the time you looked at all the loopholes, the average tariff cut in a number of developing countries over agricultural products, you're looking at 1%. <laughs> it's, not, it's not a viable number. And because of the change in the global agricultural markets during that same time, that text is no longer credible because it would not create, frankly, new opportunities for producers to send products from countries that are increasing their exports to the countries that are increasing their imports. It's just not gonna bring down those barriers. And so we've been pretty clear that we're charged with creating a new post Bali work program to finish that uh, Doha round in the next six months, but that for us to be able to move forward, we need to make sure that the major players in the agricultural markets are all at the table and are willing to make some changes, just as we are. So thank you very much for your talk. I really enjoy. Um, I just have a quick question. I'd like to learn a little more about uh, export subsidies in the U.S. It's because um, we just learned that uh, from the news, U.S. just filed you know, the case against China at WTO. 
So then uh, I'm not quite sure whether that also includes uh, agriculture export subsidies in China because um, we just learned that uh, from the news. U.S. just filed, you know, the case against China at WTO. So then uh, I'm not quite sure whether that also includes uh, agriculture export subsidies in China or not, but uh, at least uh, uh, I want to know the situations uh, in the U.S., uh, what kind of export subsidies uh, the U.S. might have, and then your perspective of the U.S. You know, filing against China at WTO for the export subsidies that they um, provided in demonstration base. Yeah, th so the demonstration basis case that we just took, uh, we just filed for consultations, so we've not yet asked for a full panel, but have asked for a consultation under the uh, WTO dispute settlement system. So for this demonstrated basis system, which essentially is a system of export subsidies across a number of areas in China's um, economy, including agriculture and products, like particularly horticulture products. Um, in the WTO, uh, you have to have an allowance for export subsidies for particular products. Um, the United States does not currently operate any export subsidy programs in agriculture. The last operational program we had was called the DEEP program, the Dairy Export Incentive Program, and it was um, abolished in the last Farm Bill in 2014. So we no longer operate direct export subsidy programs. But export subsidies in the Doha Round, the one really good ag commitment we'd all agreed to, but the first rule of trade negotiation is nothing agreed, nothing's agreed till everything's agreed, so you have to finish the whole contract before it goes into force, was to, to work to eliminate all export subsidies. And um, Europe used to be a big user of them through their common agriculture policy reform program. They have really reduced their usage of those subsidies. Um, and you know, the general recognition is that export subsidies are the most trade distorting types of subsidies because, of course, they're directly providing rebates to, for product that leaves the country. So it basically automatically decreases the price at which you can sell uh, your products on the world market and, and really changes the terms of competition. Uh, for other countries trying to do the same. So uh, again, I think you'll see many countries are moving away from using direct export subsidies. The previous question, I didn't thank you before the question, so I'll thank you twice now, thank you, thank you. <laughs> but uh, this next question is a bit of a tension in the story, right? So you began the presentation indicating that, oh, this basket needs to double in size. Uh, so we need, to, we need more food because more people are going urban and there will frankly be more people and there are more people in the middle class. Now, towards the end of the discussion, it seems very much reversed where, oh, we're subsidizing and uh, trying to outcompete each other too much and therefore providing uh, too much food at too low prices. I think Could we're providing the wrong food in the wrong place. I, uh, I think okay. there's a difference here. Mm -hmm. Because I think that you risk a real misallocation of resources if you provide, again, a higher price than you would normally command in the market. It encourages you to use more inputs than necessary or than maybe that the ecological system can provide and to overproduce in one area, where in fact, both, both economically and ecologically, you might produce more efficiently somewhere else. And it's not without cost to move food products at a great distance if you are distorting the terms of the market and where you're producing it. There are fossil fuels involved. There's quality loss while it's there. So, you know, in general, you want to make sure that your people are producing where they have the greatest comparative advantage and sending it to places that need it and that you're able to get a variety of product to a variety of places. Again, going back to that nutrition piece, um, I think, you know, a lot of, um, it used to be that in development circles, the buzzword on agriculture was self-sufficiency and that you know, people were supposed to try to produce all of their calories. Well, even the United States, if you look at our climate and you look at the massive amount of fertile land that we have, we shouldn't be food self-sufficient. We can only produce certain crops at certain times of year. <laughs> there are other countries that are much better at growing our coffee. <laughs> We'd have to have all of Hawaii planted to coffee beans in order to be self-sufficient. That's probably not the best use of our natural resources. Um, and, you know, or our economy, frankly, to be that <laughs> devoted to agriculture to feed our people. Um, so I think it's a very good thing and a good example that I'm able to give to other countries to say the United States is not only the biggest exporter of food, we're the biggest importer of food as well. And we import things 
particularly in the wintertime, that we can't grow here. And what that often does, and what we're finding, if you look at, um, for example, our pork producers. U.S. pork producers are big investors in pork production in China. And the reason is not only that they see, you know, China's a competitor, but if China can produce enough pork and do it efficiently, they create demand in China for people who can't just afford pork on a special occasion, but who will then incorporate pork into a more of a staple part of their diet, and we're gonna sell them more pork. So there are some real sort of win-win opportunities here to creating, again, a varied diet on um, a more seasonal basis where there's cross-investment opportunity, but where not everyone is trying to do everything or perhaps overproducing on products that could be more efficiently produced elsewhere if the subsidy advantage wasn't being provided. Are we ever gonna get to the point where we figured out exactly who should grow what where perfectly? No, because no market is perfect. But we can kind of get rid of some of those distortions that might help make those decisions a little bit better. Hi, thank you so much for coming. It was a very interesting um, speech. I just have a quick question about um, TTIP in relation to food procurement. Um, so there's been a lot of progress made in recent years with local school districts um, around the U.S. Um, making the shift toward purchasing local food from, from the farmers within their states or region, region, regions um, that, you know, kind of promote local economies and things like that. And there's a lot of, you know, growing concern that TTIP and the opening of more trade agreements with Europe and, and the Asia-Pacific region would put those types of programs at jeopardy because then it would be, once again, the, that food procurement would be open to international producers and it would kind of lose the progress that has been made in supporting those local farmers and economies. I'm just wondering what is USTR's stance on that and are, what, are you kind of, what are your thoughts on, on that issue? Uh, I think it's a non-issue because frankly the government procurement chapters of our trade agreements deal with procurement at the national level only. So states and, and local programs would have to very specifically opt in and make their own mm -hmm. voluntary decision on whether they would want uh, other countries, other jurisdictions even, to be able to compete for those contracts. Right. There, there, are, just, there are states that are now, you know, a lot of states are opting into these trade agreements and, and it is, you know, creating those types right. of issues. And, and so. they do so on the basis of a positive list. So basically they would have to opt those programs in. Right. So right. Okay. they're in control of whether they would want to do that. So again, I don't think it is uh, actually an issue um, of, of overreach there. I think that there is um, perfect policy space right now to be able to operate both programs to encourage the mm -hmm. local, uh, local food markets, uh, food sheds, food hubs, uh, right. encouraging local production, something you know, we worked very diligently on at, at USDA. But the, um, there's not a, a threat there to being able to operate those policies. Professor Du Bois, did I see your hand going up? Um, I'm, I'm curious, and thank you, thank you, Madam Vetter, uh, Madam Ambassador. Uh, I'm curious about the, uh, you, you alluded to this in your, uh, when you talked about U.S. pork producers investing in China uh, to increase the productivity of Chinese swine production, I suppose. And I wonder what, and perhaps this isn't in your purview, but you, I'm sure you're familiar with uh, any sort of the initiatives that the U.S. government is taking to transfer agricultural technologies uh, into other parts of the world. The reason I ask this is a number of years ago, I took a group of students to Brazil and we visited Embrapa, mm -hmm. which is the Brazilian sort of uh, agricultural scientific community <laughs> yeah. or whatever. And, they're, and they've come up with some pretty significant initiatives and, and discoveries in terms of how to make unfertile land, infertile land, fertile. And, and grow crops and, and soybeans and so forth for export. So I, I wonder what programs the U.S. government has uh, in this area or in these areas, or is it left up to the private sector and uh, the investors? No, uh, there are a number of different things we do as the U.S. government to um, promote research and to disseminate research, do extension work, collaborative research with other countries. Um, we, there's some we do in collaboration with the private sector. There's some we do as more of a um, through AID, for example, as more of sort of development projects, um, many of them often in concert with other government governments, some in concert with the private sector. 
So USDA has our Agricultural Research Service, where we have publicly financed agricultural basic research, and the whole point is that the results of that research and how to use the products of that research are then publicly available. And we often take the results of that research to other countries and help them to implement and to adopt new plant varieties that are disease resistant or better yielding. China's apple industry is a good example of ARS at work, quite frankly. <laughs> so uh, a lot of the, the apple orchards were established there with ARS varieties. Um, so we do, we do a number of, of things uh, through the research angle. Um, we, through the International Agency for International Development, USAID, we work in concert with governments and private sector. I oversaw at the Department of Agriculture our uh, programs on school feeding and nutrition that not only had uh, provided food to do that feeding, but also encouraged the development of those feeding programs, including uh, local, local purchase requirements and cooperation with, with farmers to improve uh, demand and, and those local food sheds in those other countries. Um, so we have, um, Land Lakes is a, a company that I find, or a cooperative actually, that I find particularly interesting and in that they have a you know, whole unit devoted to their international development work. And um, they did a, prog a, pr a program in concert with USDA in Mozambique on chicken. And the demand for poultry in Mozambique as incomes grew uh, was really increasing. But their local poultry production, frankly, was not very good. It wasn't high quality, it wasn't efficient, they couldn't keep up with demand. And what ended up happening is that if you had a boatload of chicken and you sent it to Europe and it got rejected because it was infested or dirty or not up to code, it found its way to Mozambique and in their port where they may not have had the testing or the inspectors or whatever in place. And that's not okay <laughs> that there are markets where, frankly, um, that kind of dumping occurs. Because you're a poorer population does not mean you don't have the right to high quality food. And so what Land Lakes did was went in and helped develop the poultry industry in concert with USDA. And they are a cooperative, so they set up a cooperative type system like they use in the United States. And they helped with cross investment where owners set up their flocks they built a processing facility that was up to modern standards where they could each then take those birds and built the poultry industry. What that did for the United States was created a great market for feed grain because the chickens need to eat. <laughs> and they need to eat corn and soybeans, which we're very good at producing. And so it became an export opportunity, but also something that fed a population that needed more protein and made sure that it was high quality and safe product. And they're exporting to their neighbors. So helping to meet that demand uh, in the region as well. So they're very sort of practically based products like that, all the way down to basic research through ARS uh, across, in agencies across the government, um, where all of you in the chairs, frankly, could be involved in. There are some pretty interesting careers doing that out there. So. Since I don't see any, oh, no, Jemison. So what I, what I will suggest is if you have another question, you might want to give me a hint at the moment because otherwise Ambassador Vetter is going to be, uh, she's been standing over there for about an hour and talking uh, uh, continuously. And so we want to get her moving over and everybody else moving over to the uh, refreshments. Um, so, Jemison. So you've talked a little bit about the Doha round and uh, TTIP before. So just kind of going back to TPP. Um, I think one of the big holdups has been negotiations regarding agricultural project, products, particularly rice in Japan. Mm -hmm. So I was just wondering what you see as, I guess, the biggest holdups to negotiations or possible ways to alleviate them. Um, well, uh, just as, you know, it's not just rice. <laughs> Japan is, uh, frankly, one of our biggest ag export markets. It's our number one export market for beef and for pork. It's number three for rice and number three for dairy but it also has one of the most complicated and protected agricultural markets in the world. Um, you're looking at an out of quota tariff for rice of 778%. Um, prohibitive, right? No one would purchase rice at that price. And so um, this is really a, a big question for Japan on how to provide uh, market access in these areas that if you look at the other free trade agreements that Japan has negotiated with its partners, agriculture was just excluded. And so to take a step back from that, I think it speaks to the value of the TPP negotiations themselves, their strategic value as an alliance among countries in Asia, looking to counter other leaders in Asia who maybe don't want to set the same kind of rules, right? So there's a strategic and a foreign policy goal here. 
But there's also access to some pretty key economies. You know, on the developed side, you have Canada, the US, Japan, key developed markets, Australia, New Zealand. On the developing side, you have major emerging economies who are really dynamic places to look at increasing export opportunities, Vietnam and Malaysia. Um, we're building a platform. So the expectation is that once TPP is complete and enacted, other countries will join. You have Taiwan, Korea, the Philippines, all already knocking at the door and asking to be evaluated to join an agreement that hasn't yet entered into effect. And so I think it speaks to the power of the agreement itself. And then you have the rules negotiations, high standards in intellectual property, disciplines on state-owned enterprises, um, transparency rules, back to some of the things we talked about in trade facilitation, transparency and decision making, so you just know the basis on which you're doing business. A commitment to set sanitary and phytosanitary standards according to science, which again is very helpful um, in the agricultural arena. So the value and the, the level of commitment on the rules side, as well as the fact that every product is on the table in agriculture, makes this an agreement of, of high value and frankly gives Japan the leverage it needs politically with the other good things <laughs> to be able to put those products on the table. Um, but it's not easy and it hasn't been done before and frankly it's what's been occupying a good deal of my time for the past year or so. <laughs> and so we still have a little ways to go but um, you know these are, Japan has incredibly skilled negotiators who are very technically savvy and we have, uh, as hard as it has been, we work well together and I think we're making good progress. So, you know, I expect to see a deal on the table that, um, you know, respects the fact that, that Japan has agricultural sensitivities, but puts a great deal of value on the table for U.S. agriculture. And so I think uh, we will have our last question over here. I had some, but I'll ask them afterwards. So, um, but Great. Thank you so much again. Um, according to uh, Philip McMichael, um, roughly two million small-scale corn growers lost their um, means to an income post ratification of NAFTA and seeing as the Trans-Pacific Partnership is dwarfs NAFTA in scale and economic size um, and I'm assuming that a lot of small scale growers exist within these countries that will be enacted when, within this free trade agreement is, are there any stances or measures being taken within these discussions or by the USTR with regard to how to mitigate or prevent such losses? Well, again, I think any time you talk about trade, um, there is, first of all, very broad benefits to consumers, to uh, GDP, to jobs, but there can be sometimes concentrated pain. Uh, and the headline of any paper is going to be a textile mill that closes. No one does a, a story, an article in the paper about the five jobs at this plant or the four jobs at that plant or what have you. And so the impact of trade on, on global GDP, on the fact that Mexico is now actually quite a large ag exporter. It has largely modernized its agriculture industry, um, both in products produced for local consumption and in its position in the global marketplace is not a story that gets told very often. Um, it is true that they have seen real adjustments in their ag sector. And it is true that there are domestic programs that have been utilized to assist those populations. Can you attribute all of that to NAFTA? I'm not sure that you necessarily can. Uh, I think the global trade in ag products is happening and increasing even among countries that are not signatories to these kinds of agreements. There's greater demand for a greater variety of food products and more countries who are offering them. What trade agreements provide, at least is some transparency and some rules, by way, rules and predictability on which that trade will occur. And so it, kind of, it can cut both ways. <laughs> um, at least you know what the tariff will be. Uh, you know how your product is going to be judged. You know what standards you will be ne need to meet to have them accepted by another country or have your country accept them in to, to meet those kinds of standards. So I think there, um, there's a little bit of conflation that happens between the effects of an agreement and the effects of globalization generally. Um, and those aren't always um, directly attributable, but I think subsistence agriculture systems in a number of places around the world are facing some of those same pressures. And some of it comes from tariff relief, some of it comes from you know, other, other efforts to, to modernize and compete. But I, um, one of my jobs when I worked at USTR as a civil servant the first time was to serve on the Corn and Beans Task Force. <laughs> and it was developed very specifically to look at how to implement things like better roads, 
to put in place storage facilities, to do some of the outreach from the U.S. to the Mexican government to say, you know, NAFTA, when it had gone into effect 15 years earlier, corn, beans, and sugar were the last three tariffs to be eliminated in NAFTA because of the sensitivity of their products. And that's typical. In the products that are the most sensitive, one of the tools you use is on day one, everything doesn't go to zero. It phases out over time, precisely to allow some markets to adjust. But if there's still adjustment needed, if it's better infrastructure and access to markets, better seed variety, varieties, Mexico is still lagging behind in making sure that farmers have access to hybrids even. And that's an area that we continue to work with them very closely through USDA and agricultural cooperation. Um, we're helping build their capacity in poultry processing, for example, um, which of course then builds markets for their corn producers to feed their chickens. <laughs> These are all, all sort of linked. So, you know, Mexico is our neighbor, and frankly, when their ag markets do well, we do well uh, in turn. And so we have a, a direct vested interest in that, and NAFTA is one way we frankly strengthen those relationships as well as the trade relationship. Well, and on those words, I think that we shall uh, thank you so very much, Ambassador Vetter, for, uh, for coming over. Uh, very good. So we have uh, a few cookies, lemonade and, uh, and uh, water uh, and ice um, uh, over there, right around the corner. So Ambassador Vetter has been kind enough to, uh, to stay, to agree to stay, to, uh, to talk to people interested in uh, talking to her. So for the next um, 20, 25 minutes, uh, she's going to be here.